Hi, I'm Jim Clark, Visual Arts Manager here at Hopkins Center for the Arts. Today we're speaking with Eric John Olson about his exhibition, Unnatural, on view in our first floor lobby gallery through March 30th, 2024. Eric, welcome. Thank you. Your work is made out of quilted plastic waste. That is correct. Why this material? Um, I left the advertising industry in, oh, about 2005. A friend of mine was starting a business making functional items out of quilted plastic. He figured out that it could be run through the sewing machine. Yeah. Um, I helped him uh, source raw product, do a little initial R&D. And since I was um, adept at branding, I branded the company for him. Um, that process also has waste. So he talked me into taking the waste home and seeing if I could make art out of it. I think his real goal was to get the waste out of his house <laughs> and into mine. <laughs> anyway, I, I started sewing the scraps together, just, you know, pretty randomly, seeing how it went. Um, took until about 2010 to, to really get a direction going. But um, why this stuff, it was rather by accident. And just to use up some materials and see if they could not hit the uh, landfills. So there's a little bit of plastic not hitting the landfills. Not a whole lot, but a little tiny bit. <laughs> In, um, you, you've quoted uh, a, a philosopher, a, 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 a journalist. A journalist. Marshall McLuhan. Yeah. And, and what is that quote? Um, the medium is the message. Yeah. Explain that. Um, well, in my case, <laughs> it is um, most of the messages I have are about um, environmental justice and social justice. Um, the plastic is, um, is a metaphor for our consumption. Um, and oftentimes, the plastic represents plastic. In my, um, it's a direct um, reference to plastic. Mm -hmm. um, the piece above uh, Jim there, um, Kumo over Fuji. Uh, this last, within this last year, the climate scientists in Japan found microplastics in the atmosphere in the clouds above Mount Fuji. So that piece is made from plastic and it waste and is about plastic waste. So that's where the medium is, is the message is in my work. Marshall McLuhan's was a little bit different, but the, <laughs> but the uh, um, quote is transferable. It applies beautifully. Um, the, there's a number of uh, words that are, evident here and there, or letters at least. Um, you're using waste, so um, tell us a little bit about that too. Is, are we talking about uh, our plastic grocery bags that we leave the grocery store with? Um, or is this, I think you've, you've said it's pre-consumer waste, largely. Some of it is pre-consumer waste, yeah. the bags that um, Bulk Foods yeah. comes to a grocery store in. Um, a lot of it is shopping bags, not the convenience bags at a grocery store, but like, a, like branded bright color plastic bags that you'd get like from the toy store next door. <laughs> yeah. those, are, those kinds of bags. Um, it's primarily uh, LPDE or LDPE, low density polyethylene. Um, that's the number four on that little chasing arrow symbol. It is recyclable 
No one recycles it because it clogs up the recycling machines. Mm. So, uh, in essence, when we put those in our bins, that's what they say, wish cycling? It, that's wish cycling. Yeah, it's not really... Only one and two get, are actually getting recycled in Minneapolis. Mm. Is there plastic waste that um, you'll refuse to use? Is there yes. something... What, what, um, high density polyethylene because yeah. it doesn't the needle won't go through it. That'd okay. be like your uh, uh, milk carton or uh, soda plastic soda bottle. Mm -hmm. um, I can't use thick foam because that doesn't go through the sewing machine. Um, I don't like to use like uh, potato chip bags or or snack bags. Any of the plastic that if you move it at crunches you can hear the crunching of it a lot mm -hmm. what happens with that plastic is you put a whole bunch of little holes next to one another in that plastic and it just breaks apart mm -hmm. like a perforation yes yeah. yes uh how much like trial and error research and development did you do to land on just this mix i mean did you try those other materials and mm -hmm. you discovered that it wasn't that mm -hmm. there was some Quilted plastic waste as an art medium source book. No, that you there referred was. to. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was trial and error. Um, it didn't. It didn't take long because you know we're. Um, most of that was done when I was helping my friend with his business. Mm -hmm. um, we found out quickly that what types of plastic. Maybe it was months. Mm -hmm. Is all it took to try all kinds of different ones and land on the, the um, LDPE. Are there any artists that you look to for inspiration or that you're influenced by, whether they're using similar materials or something entirely different? I mean, what, what artists do you admire? Um, the artists I admire, um, none of them are working <laughs> in, in this. The closest would be um, Basil Kincaid. Um, he's very young compared to me. Um, he, he's a textile artist and does very large pieces. They, they'd be like six times this. Um, and he uses cloth, but it's um, put together much like mine are. It, 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 it's not random, but it looks random. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I also um, am highly influenced by Stuart Davis sure. from the 50s and 60s. Um, his paintings um, were bright colors and sharp lines. Um, they are abstract. Um, it looks like you can see a pattern in them, but there is no pattern. And it's because of the rhythm of the shape and the color. Um, is a big influence. Um, Ella Nachwi is a big influence. He's from um, Ghana and Nigeria. Um, some of you may have seen his work on your travels. He's in uh, many, many museums in the United States. He does monumental size pieces made out of metal bottle top caps that are um, held together with um, reclaimed copper wire. And they're absolutely gorgeous. Um, what I take from him is trying to make detritus beautiful. And one more, um, a uh, Canadian photographer, um, Edward Bertinsky. He did a coffee table book and documentary titled Manufactured Landscapes. And his f photographs are compositionally j just beautiful. And they're full of all kinds of texture. Um, and you're so drawn to it because the composition and texture are just so attractive. Um, and you're looking at it and there's this split second where you think, oh my goodness, that's beautiful. And then you realize what it is. And all of a sudden, it's still beautiful, but you, there's this mm -hmm. cognitive yeah, dissonance. Exactly, uh, mm -hmm. exactly. 
Um, my work doesn't, the cognitive dissonance doesn't happen that fast. Usually doesn't happen until one reads the title. Mm -hmm. But there is a, those are four. <laughs> That's dynamite. Oh, and you. <laughs> he inspired a piece down towards the end, um, Death for the Mangroves. Um, Jim does beautiful drawings of the North Woods, and I tried to I didn't rip mean... him off. On... <laughs> now it sounds like I just teed you up for that. All right. That's very generous of you to, to say. Thank you. Um, I've been following your work for some time. Uh, you had a show here four years ago. It was kind of COVID. Uh, mm -hmm. And um, you have uh, created works that are representational. We have one, at least, mm -hmm. in the show, and some that are within that spectrum. I mean, we've got a bird, and it's recognizable as a bird. You were just in the most recent Arts North exhibition uh, with the straight jackets, mm -hmm. uh, a, a charged political work. Um, but the majority of the pieces in this show stretch to non-objective uh, imagery. I mean, they're just textural uh, um, symphonies, really. Mm -hmm. And, and they're, they don't have that object that they're referring to. Um, is that a direction that you find yourself moving more? Or is it something that you've always um, juggled uh, over, over the t you know, your time making art? Um, I have always juggled it. Mm -hmm. um, when, I, when I was first um, doing this with the quilted plastic waste, it was purely shape, form, color, um, and completely lacking content. Mm -hmm. um, then I uh, realized that, you know, I should, be, <laughs> I should be using plastic to make comments about plastic. Mm. Uh, that's when I started um, doing more representational um, work, still interspersed with the abstract, um, now it's almost all, almost all abstract. I don't yeah. I don't do nearly as much representational, and when I do, I I really lean on the pop artists for what those would look like. Sure. Related to that, then uh, process wise, does a piece uh, essentially appear to you fully formed in your head? Can you visualize it? Um, and then you go out to make it? Or do you start by doing some drawings and preparatory work? Because um, you have a, maybe a, a sense of what it could look like, but you work it out by hand? Or is it purely you go to the machine and grab some materials and see where it takes you? How, how does it work? Um, well, because I w was trained in advertising and all the creative is done from a creative platform, in, at my age, instead of trying to not do that mm -hmm. and, and go with what, <laughs> the latter of what you said, um, I, do the, I do the former. Uh, the concept, I won't start a piece without a fully developed concept. I might not have a fully developed image, but, I, but it will be very very clear where, where I'm going to go with that. Sure. Um, it often starts, um, I'll just jot down a, a little idea I hear here or there. Um, I pick up inspiration from everywhere that I can. Usually I pick up inspiration from um, news articles or, um, or like, uh, Smithsonian Magazine, um, my news feed for environmental news, mm -hmm. get a lot of ideas from that. Um, do, you get, do you get angry reading the things that you read? I mean, is, oh, yeah. is part of this <laughs> exercising or, or sublimating yes, yes. that particular um, Kind of yeah, that yeah. sitting with the machine going, and you're, it's, it gets almost meditative, and 
I can kind of breathe a little deeper and yeah. <laughs> let it go because I'm making my statement. And um, I think this is something new to me about th that originally when you were working with the material, it was not content oriented. It was more about it, it wasn't uh, the as, aesthetics of it. Yes, yeah. it wasn't as content driven. And you're finding it's becoming more and more, more and so. more content driven. Yes, even the abstract ones, they're still content. Yeah. And do you, th uh, is that um, a response to working with those materials as closely and intimately as you have and over a sustained period of time that you've reflected on what they mean more or um, Yes. <laughs> yeah. It, it's become deeper yes. over time. We don't want the short answer. <laughs> uh, I mean, describe, it. was it an awakening, uh, an awakening of sorts? No. It, yeah. It, 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 it just, gradually, yeah. gradually happened. Mm -hmm. um, one of the first ones I did um, along this line was much much more general. It was a, uh, about the um, law of um, conservation of matter. Mm -hmm. Neither created nor destroyed. That's what, that's what the title of the piece was, which is big picture yeah. of what this is. And then as I went along, I realized, you know, I could get more pointed with, with the message. Sure. And trying to bite off a big message like, like that was, is a little much. Daunting? Um, or? Yeah, the content kind of gets lost because there's too much. Sure. So uh, bring it into a tighter focus. Right. Yeah. yeah. So it, too much to chew at once. Right. Yeah. Um, from a formal standpoint, I mean, they're rich in texture, absolutely exploding with texture, um, but the color too. And because so much of the material that you're using is transparent or translucent, semi-opaque, you're arriving at colors almost like uh, a watercolorist doing multiple washes because there's a mixing. Yes, that does happen. Yeah. In, uh, do you wrestle with that much? Do you, do you go with it? How, how do you approach color? Particularly given it's, it's kind of a collagist aesthetic. You've got things that are mm -hmm. already made, so you can't make it another color. Right. Or do you? Are there any times that you make a piece of plastic a different color? Um, yes, with very translucent plastics. Yeah, so you're, you're layering. Yeah, I do, I, yeah but you don't do dye them or paint oh, them. Oh, no. Yeah. I use the plastic just, <laughs> just mm -hmm. the way it is. Um, in using um, the consumer level plastics, um, like the bright colors on paper towel yeah. wrapping and that, that kind of plastic, I don't really have to think about the color because those, <laughs> knowing the, the marketing industry, those colors have all been focus grouped <laughs> to be yeah. attractive. Yeah. So I already know those are very attractive, <laughs> attention getting sure. colors. Um, I do have to watch it because I can run out of a color in, the, in midstream. Mm -hmm. And because of the ethos of what I do, I don't allow myself to go out and buy something with that color of plastic. That just, <laughs> that would be cheating to me. No An one else would know, discipline. but I would know. <laughs> right? Yeah. I mean, because the, the, the painter is going to go get Elizabeth uh, Crimson. Right. Right. And right. That, that's... I don't do that. Yeah. And um, I might have to switch, switch colors midstream, and then I, then I do. Mm. How much of the material is new, if any? For instance, I have to imagine um, you buy the thread. Yes, yeah. but it is overstock and, and um, discontinued thread. Harris Warehouse 
filters might be very aware of Harris Warehouse. It's a lot of nodding. <laughs> lot of, um, they do sell new thread, but I don't buy their new thread. Um, underneath the cutting tables, if you're familiar with that place, there are bins and boxes full of these giant cones of thread. That's the thread I use. I do buy it, but it's, it's uh, off the retail market. It's not on the retail market mm -hmm. in a sense because it is, it's left over. That's, I'm getting it secondhand, basically. Yeah, yeah. yeah. In f formerly, uh, it's another layer of color. Mm -hmm. I mean, you've, you've got a lot of optical blending going on to the point that there are colors that you're describing. It's like, it's very challenging to identify what, what is that color, right? <laughs> and it's like, a, it's like a stippler, it's like yeah. Syrah or an impressionist mm -hmm. in that you've got colors next to colors next to colors. Um, and then one sometimes asserts itself as, as the dominant color and it's kind of activated and enlivened by something next to it. And other times it's like, what is that color? Which I think is, is really magical. Um, how, how do you make your thread choices as you're making each unit? Well, I don't have a huge amount of thread. Yeah. Um, but I do just go by like that one, picking colors that are, have blueness to them. Sure. Not necessarily, like the gray up there is a cool gray. Mm -hmm. So there is a blueness to it. Yeah. Um, or this one has a gray in it too, but the gray is warm. Yeah. So I, it's, it's like, um, it, some, the color will feel brown even though it's not brown. Feel brown. Yeah, That's, or yeah. feel blue mm -hmm. or, or be hot or cold or, and then I, I rely on a lot of color tropes like sky is blue, water is blue, grass is green, um, dirt is brown. Coating out the local colors yeah, of yeah, things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, back, I, I started asking about it, and then I went off on another direction. But um, the language that appears. So here we've got elements of of letters and words, but they've broken down to being just textural, graphic elements. But mm -hmm. uh, down the way, there's one that has pretty large. I'll say panels, and you might have a different word for it, but that have a parent, it says airspace, but it's been flipped the other way mm -hmm. so that it's, it's inverted. It takes you a while to read it. It takes you a while to read it, mm -hmm. but it seems intentional. Mm -hmm. it can, was, was that an intentional move to keep airspace, but to flip it backwards? And, um, most likely. Which yeah. piece is that? It's the long one around the corner, and I, you know, I'm oh, forgot. you the forgot rain, a title earlier. The rain so. one. I, <laughs> Irregular rain. Yes, yes, yes. The airspace is definitely right. Definitely um, purposeful. But we question it because it's flipped, mm -hmm. just as you're questioning our relationship to consumerism and mm -hmm. the environment. Yeah, is that fair to say? Yes, that's fair yeah. to say. Oh, back to back to the thread. When I first started, because I wasn't a quilter, thread to me was something to hold something else together. So <laughs> I paid absolutely no attention to it at all. And then I, eventually I got to the point where I went, oh, maybe I should start paying attention to this color. You had started making things already in this mm -hmm. way. And originally mm -hmm. that was not a consideration. I didn't think about the thread at all. I was just, Chucking yeah. the plastic together. And coming from a um, time uh, and deadline sensitive industry, not far off of that, yeah. I was chucking them together as fast as I could. Then I retired and realized I don't have to do that anymore. <laughs> Did the work get better? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Way. Really? After, yep. Yeah, yeah. After I um, got rid of my anxiety of time, which still hangs around in the back of my head, mm -hmm. um, and realized that the thread was as important as the plastic, sure. then it made a huge, it just made an enormous leap. Yeah. 
Have you always uh, sewn? I've always known how to. Yeah. I learned how to sew probably in junior high or high school. And the only reason I learned is because I thought it would be handy to know how to sew, like it's handy to know how to rewire a lamp. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's how I approach sewing. Is. It was purely a functional thing. It was purely functional. Practical. Practical. Mm -hmm. That's the word, practical. Yeah. <laughs> how, well, then how did you arrive at, well, I could use this skill uh, for aesthetic concerns? Did, it, it, it was helping It was helping my, my friend with his business, yeah. yeah. And your friend knew that you knew how to sew. Oh, yeah. And that was, that was the yeah. root of it. Yeah. And he also knew that I liked to, um, I had been a um, multimedia. Mm -hmm. I liked to work in that and I, I would pick things up, just scraps of whatever and, and put them together to, to make something. And he knew that I already had that um, penchant for, for uh, putting together leftovers which came, that came all the way from my childhood. That was a serendipitous moment. Yes. Yep. Have you always been an artist? Um, y y yes, I'm gonna answer that, <laughs> yes. Cause I've always been, I've always made things. Yeah. From the time I, that I can very first remember. Mm -hmm. I remember being a little kid, maybe five years old sitting on a beach with rocks on it and everybody was playing in the water and I was taking the rocks and, and sand and, and trying to make something out of it. And I, if I'm sitting at a restaurant, I'm folding up the napkin, if I'm, <laughs> you know. I'm, there's a, when you say that, I mean, there's a, there's a little bit of that three-dimensional planar construction that goes on, you know, I'll say, origami simply because it's like a, a ready metaphor or analogy mm -hmm. for how some of the things have structure. Um, how do you approach, like th this one is maybe more flat, but uh, it's made up of multiple units. Do, are those all sewn independently? Like a, on a pinwheel, you get a triangle and a triangle and then you put them together or how does that happen? Um. Well, like these that are translucent but have this brown stripe in them, yeah, that'll be made on a foot by foot sheet. Okay, and then cut them. Then I cut them out and put them back together. Got it. Um, and the bird has some dimensionality to it in that it emerges from uh, the wall and. Mm -hmm. Do you, you plan that into it as you go? You got a, a vision oh, for I'm it? Usually, I usually have that planned into it before I even start. Yeah. And then some of them, some of the three-dimensional things I do are architectural, and some of them um, are, have uh, filling in them. And I use, uh, I use my really scrap scraps as, as the filling to make it, three-dimensional yeah and then other ones um, that one's three-dimensional by the way how close the um, nails are that it's hanging from is what makes this one three-dimensional how often does a piece not work out it used to be all of them <laughs> when I first started <laughs> now it's pretty rare yeah. Because um, I, I edit my ideas down so far. If I have an idea, I write it down, put it on a board. It may not ever come to fruition. But written. It's, 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 it's written, verbal. It's, or, or, it's verbal or, yeah. or there's a little, just a little tiny scribble mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. of something. And sometimes, Sometimes I get an idea and I just go with it because I know it's working. Sometimes I have to sit with it a while. And I probably, out of all the ideas I have, maybe 1% get made. Hmm. And the rest are in the library. 
<laughs> yeah. Kind of. yeah, yeah. My library is getting a little dusty with age. But <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. Let's open it up to questions. What kind of machine do you use? What kind of sewing machine? Oh, <laughs> thank you for asking. I use my uh, grandmother's old machine. It's from 1960. It's a Singer knockoff. It's called a dial and sew. They were built in Japan. And it, all it does is straight stitch and zigzag. Um, I can do free motion with it, but it's, it's not easy like a, a brand new FAP or something. It's, it's not that smooth, but it, it can be done. And that's your only tool? That, and I have a uh, uh, little home serger that wraps the edges. The, here. The first serger I had, um, I was really purist, and I traded a used laptop for a used serger. <laughs> in about 2007, it conked out in 22. So I went and I bought a used serger because I thought, I can't buy a new one. I've got to have a used one. And that conked out within a year. So I went against my own <laughs> rules, and I bought a new one. We can edit that part out. <laughs> cool. um, hi. hi, I love your work. Uh, do you, you ever sketch it out, or do you look at a work and then go with it as it progresses? Um, I usually, very few times do I go with it as it progresses. And if I'm doing that, I already know what it's going to look like when it's done. So do like the um, hurricane piece to the right of Jim there. Uh -huh. That one I went as, as I went along, but I knew exactly what it was going to look like. Um, usually I have just a little tiny scribble, about this big. I'll scan it in a computer, blow it up to about this big, and then trace it over and over and over again, like Lichtenstein would do. To get, to get his images, and each time you adjust it a little bit till it gets where I like it. Then I scan that in and um, print it out at full scale for a template or to use actually as the pattern pieces. Yes. Computers have helped artists. Oh, yeah. oh my God. When I was in college, it was altogether different. And I, and I use used computer paper, too. I, I don't put new sheets in. That's good. Whatever helps us. Yeah. <laughs> um, I have two questions. Um, ask one at a time, because I won't remember the first one oh. after you ask. <laughs> it's very simple. <laughs> do, you, do you find that um, using the machine that it works better with polyester or cotton um, uh, threads? Um, I use whatever is available. Oh, so and I don't, I don't even look at the little label inside the cone that tells you what kind of paper. I don't look at that. Okay. I just... I just use what, what's there. And my other question is, the representational um, bird is so different than the other works along here. Do you find that you go along and um, it just comes to your mind that you want to do something representational and then um, something more ethereal? Mm -hmm. or, well, the, the concept will lend itself to does it need to be more representational? Um, and as I had to told Jim before, I do less and less representational mm -hmm, and more yeah. and more abstract. Um, this piece, oh, the date's not on there. I think it's like 2012. Oh, okay. Um, and the rest of them all the way down are all from 2022 and later. Okay, thank you. Okay, my question is, um, a somewhat sewer with an older machine. How in the world do you handle the size of some of these things? Do you do them in small pieces and then put them together, or how do you do that? 
yeah, I, I have to engineer the piece to be able to sew it. So the, the design is um, done in mind that I can't wad this up or roll it up and stick it through that little <laughs> space in a sewing machine that's about this big. Um, so like this one, it, it, these stripes will be done and then I'll sew the stripes together. Um, I'll create these and then I, I have to, like this, I started here and just went out adding piece, one piece at a time. Do you ever hand stitch anything when you can't get the machine to work? Um, no, I haven't hand stitched yet. It's, I, I don't discount it as an option, but I haven't done it yet. Thank you. Could you talk a little bit about how your studio is set up? I mean, you have like 5,000. <laughs> oh, you're going to like yeah. this. <laughs> <laughs> if you didn't hear Patty, she's asking how Eric's got a studio set up. It's, uh, um, I live in a very small house. It's a 9 by 13 bedroom. Most of my friends' closets are bigger than, <laughs> bigger than the studio that I have. Um, the uh, furniture that I use, table, chair, sewing machine cabinet, they all have uh, felt on the bottom of the legs and the floor is hard. So I can shuffle it around. My sewing table is, a, is an old, um, used of course, dining room table that has the leaves in it that snap up and you can spread it apart and put the additional ones in. So I can adjust the size of that table to, to fit the art. Um, and uh, on, I use old table pads as, um, what's the quilt board called that's usually up vertical? Design board. I use, the, I use those as a design board. And I'll pin the pieces to the, to the design board, which is a <laughs> table pad. <laughs> and then I can take a piece out, and I can mark it with pins where it goes back in again, and uh, attach the next piece, put it in, mark it with pins where it goes, just goes in and out, but yeah, the studio is very small. The uh, um, closet is filled with um, cardboard drawers from elementary schools, you know, where you pull it out and then they're just stacked with construction paper in there. My wife used to work for the public school system, so they were throwing those out and, and she brought them home and said, I think you could use these, <laughs> and I could. So that's how I store my materials. By color? Yes, absolutely by color. <laughs> All the greens are <laughs> like in one drawer and I don't, I don't uh, it's separated by primary and secondary colors, I don't separate into tertiary colors, it would make, it would be too many drawers. <laughs> <laughs> it's remarkably resourceful, what you do. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's, um, what I hear is that the drive for that is being ecologically sound and earth friendly, but is there a certain amount of joy in repurposing things to your, you know, needs? I, I, yeah, there is. Yeah. There is a. Um, I do get satisfaction um, um, reusing something or or making something work for another, not what it was intended. Um, but what I really get satisfaction out of is that I don't have to pay for most of my material. <laughs> <laughs> I, all I do is pay for the thread, and that's used. Yeah. Or leftover, I mean. <laughs> so do you get your materials from a variety of sources then? Um, I use the plastic that comes into my house now and um, cannibalizing the very first pieces that I did that I won't let the public see. 
<laughs> so that's where a lot of it comes from. Um, I have my friend who started sewing uh, the functional items, they, he saves his plastic for me. But that's, and that's plenty. I have, I have no... You don't to, want the folks here starting no. to bring you there. Yeah. <laughs> Please, no. <laughs> uh, for your process, would you say all of these pieces are sewn? Yes. All of them are sewn. They're You've never all... used adhesive. Um, yeah, I do, but it's not to hold the piece together. Um, I found out that pinning these pieces together, it makes a big lump in the piece, and then when you go to sew it, that lump stays there. It's not like fabric that it... Um, so I tried all manner of things. It took years to find something that would work. I found a 3M indoor carpet tape that is transparent, and I can cut little tiny snips of it off to hold the um, plastic, different plastic pieces together. Like there's in between here and this top one, there's a tiny little piece of that carpet tape to hold it together to get it through the sewing machine. But sewing is a major medium. Yes, it has to, it has to be sewn. That tape isn't strong enough to hold it. So the transport of these pieces to a show, like to this show, would you roll them up? They're all rolled up into one big roll, and, and I come in and I drop it on the floor and I give it a kick, and it... And you think he's joking? I do. He's not. That's exactly what I do. <laughs> Even that big piece there. Yeah. I stack them all up in, for transport. I stack them all up and roll them up. I roll them image out um, because the plastic will keep the shape if it's rolled up for a day or two. And if it's rolled, um, if this were, if I brought this in having been rolled image in, these sides would do this. And Eric has cloth bags. Yeah, I, I store them individually. But when I ship them and transport them, um, I'll take them out of the cloth bags and I'll roll them all up as, in one unit. Thank you. Can you just pick out one piece and give us an idea of what kind of a time frame we're talking about that it takes you to make it? Sure. <laughs> Um, because I had such an anxiety about time, I had to stop thinking about it. And um, I got that question so much, I thought, you know, I'm, I need to find out really how much time a piece takes. And I'd never time myself because I don't keep regular hours. So in terms of days, any piece can take from one week to three months. But, and within that, I could never tell anybody exactly how long one took. Um, so I, I, uh, to do that, to find out how long it actually took, um, I got myself a residency. And it, in the, during the residency, I did um, the really, that 16 foot irregular rains piece. And that one I actually timed, it was 268 hours. And I got really anxious about the time too. <laughs> so I went back to not trying not to pay attention. Sorry, I didn't mean to create anxiety by You're, yeah, you're triggering me, you're triggering me. <laughs> it was all meditation time. It was, it was, you wished it took 500 hours, I heard. Yeah. Eric, thank you. Oh, thank you. I'm so happy to have a great big wall to hang great big art on. It's, <laughs> it's wonderful. Thank you, Jim. Oh, thank you.
We're speaking with Eric John Olson about his exhibition, Unnatural, on view at Hopkins Center for the Arts through March 30th, 2024.